Welcome to your lecture on the social construction of technology, where we're going to take a look at the synthesizer and a few other electronic um, instruments or ways of making music, and examine a little bit how, um, rather than being inventions out of nowhere, that really these are artifacts that are constructed as part of the very distinctive and particular social milieu, and um, this is addressed in your reading, and we'll kind of go over some of the concepts and elaborate a little bit about the early history of synthesizer and electronic music uh, in this lecture. So on to our topic of today's lecture, we're really talking about um, the social construction of technology, or SCOT for short. And what this is, is a theory developed in the, in the 70s that really posits that um, technology does not determine human inter, uh, human action. It's not technological determinism. Right? The opposite of that, actually, that technology uh, is constructed and used within a specific social milieu, in, in a specific social setting, uh, culture, etc. And you have to understand um, this setting to really um, understand the how technology operates in society. So the social construction of technology is kind of a theory uh, about how um, technology is developed and how it's eventually adopted and then eventually how the wider society uses it and it, it, it affects society in, in some ways. Um, but it's also kind of a methodology. You can kind of look at certain steps that you can follow if you want to analyze how uh, if, if technology is a success or a failure. And so we'll look at some of these steps uh, in the coming slides. So the social construction of technology posits that there are basically three stages that technology goes through in, um, uh, in, its, in its life cycle. That technology is invented, and, dur and during this kind of early time, there's a lot of interpretive flexibility with how the technology is used. And so let's think about the, the, um, the synthesizer from your article that you read, um, how really the early forms of the synthesizer, it was wide open in terms of how people would use it, uh, the form, etc., and it really only solidified um, later on. And so that's kind of the second stage that technology goes through, which is after this experimentation, there's a closure and a collapse of forms. And so, again, referring to the synthesizer, you had a wide variety of forms, some without keyboards, some with, and eventually in the 80s, really, you have that the synthesizer collapses in form and becomes kind of a very standardized piece of technology. And the third uh, stage that uh, technology goes through is really a wider adoption by society, which um, again can can solidify that form in terms of let's think about the keyboard aspect of the synthesizer. It can also encourage alteration if, if in and in after a while after how society has kind of adopted this tool, uh, if there's new needs or new um, ways of using it that can encourage kind of alteration of the form, and it can have unintended effects. And we'll see a lot of those. Uh, s several of those things later on in terms of different types of music technologies um, later on in this lecture. But I thought we'd just again review the idea um, uh, of the synthesizer. Really, uh, the synthesizer again came about in, in 1969 really with the Moog Modular 55, which is this big analog machine. It's not a digital computer, but an analog way of manipulating sound. And um, it, it again progresses very quickly to the things with the mini Moog, um, and then other companies adopt the um, kind of synthesizer technology and make their own versions. And so, if you've seen this this graph here, you have a lot of famous musicians immediately starting to use the synthesizer uh, in, in their music. The Beatles, the Rolling Stones, um, the Who, David Bowie, etc., are all using these types of new way of producing sound and manipulating sound in their music. And as you move on through the 1970s, again, you see this kind of, there, there are different forms here. This is still kind of in that stage of kind of uh, a form elaboration you'd have with a new technology and new, new ways of doing things, new technologies that are incorporated into this form. And really, once you move into the 1980s, you see this kind of collapse of form. So rather than these big, huge analog circuit boards you saw in the, in the 60s and 70s, you have this, again, collapse, this um, the, the, all the, the analog wires and connections you used to have to make on the old Moogs 
would collapse into this kind of really standardized keyboard synthesizer format uh, until you get to the later 80s and you have like where every kid has a Casio in their in their bedroom. Um, so that shows a nice example of how uh, in the early stages of technology there's a lot of form and as things get adopted and refined the form kind of settles down onto one or two different types of um, uh, physical format for the technology. But the, the, we'll go back to the kind of the original synthesizer, the Moog uh, Modular 55, and it basically it's this big bank of uh, it's a um, of analog uh, sound manipulation. And if you recall from your your reading, the keyboard edition was not originally part of the Moog, although it was added fairly quickly at the request of musicians. Um, the Moog really gave people an unprecedented way of of controlling sounds. Um, that start off really as a primary kind of sine wave or a square wave or other waveform, and by by di you know um, doing feedback or, or kind of uh, again adjusting these these waveforms, you can get just an you know, incredible variety of sound from the Moog. Um, it, the Moog was fairly complex as were early synthesizers. You had lots of patch chords running from one module to the other, kind of again trying to create these new sounds and and modifying these sounds. Um, the it, it, it was is not necessarily meant for like live performance, although people ended up using it that way in in some respects. And so um, the final sound really uh, was after running it through all these different um, filters and and passes was was created once you press a, a key on the keyboard or a ribbon controller would actually produce that final sound for you to listen to. So again, this is a, a, a amazing development in terms of music technology because up until this point we had electronic instruments but they were just amplified versions of their of their um, acoustic variety and so that when with the Moog you really have this new way of producing novel sounds that up until that point um, was um, quite rare. What made the Moog synthesizer really possible was this um, the kind of cheapness of transistors or these computer parts that were becoming cheaper and cheaper as time goes by and I put two charts up here for you to to view and really to to show that the Moog um, technologically was only possible in the, to come about in really this this 1960s time because um, before the 1960s electronic things were using electronic radios etc were using vacuum tubes which are kind of larger more bulky more expensive and once the transistor was invented in the late 50s or middle 50s you have um, this kind of uh, start st the starting of, uh, of an exponential increase of uh, kind of the use around the electronics and then once the transistor transitions to the integrated circuit or kind of computer chip and again you have this again there's still exponential growth in the number of transistors and, and integrated circuits being produced and um, an exponential decrease in the price and so you, the article you read about the Moog synthesizer mentioned these kind of cheap transistors oh my gosh they're only you know 25 cents a piece or whatever and really if you look at these charts going from you know 25 cents or 10 cents down to one cent down to really what transistors and integrated circuits are now you get billions of, of circuits for for a penny really so it's very very cheap now to have very powerful computers as everyone knows uh, the phone in your pocket is is much more powerful than even the most powerful super, supercomputer was uh, a few years ago but really this kind of um, exponential increase in, in technology uh, and the exponential decrease in cost really made the Moog synthesizer and later um, music technologies possible at discrete moments in history. And this is all familiar to you if you're in, um, familiar with computers and the idea of Moore's law um, uh, and the kind of exponential increase in computing power. But you'll, we'll talk about this more later again in, in a, as time goes by and throughout the, the semester. So before the Moog synthesizer, there were uh, very few ways of producing sound that were not, like as I mentioned, just amplified acoustic instruments. Uh, and one of those was, like, if you look at the top corner, you have the theremin, and you, I'm sure you've heard this kind of eerie sound in the Holly, early Hollywood sci-fi movies, but it basically the theremin was, was invented in the 1960s, uh, sorry, 1920s. Um, and the theremin was this kind of a, a new way of producing elect, uh, electronic sound that was not amplified acoustic instruments and I have a picture up there of 
um, Clara Rockwell, although really one of the most famous theremin players. Um, and you can buy, still buy theremin kits today if you want to experiment with them. They're quite, quite fun to mess with. But it was invented in the 1920s by Leon Theremin and uh, really was taken over by, taken by Hollywood and really used for a lot of the kind of sci-fi sounds you're going to hear in early Hollywood films. And that persisted until really, until the uh, invention of the synthesizer, the Moog synthesizer, and that um, and was, was taken up again by Hollywood and musicians immediately um, because of the kind of it, the musical and sonic possibilities that the instrument offered. Um, and so what I wanted to have you do is pause, and I'm, I've linked um, the video down below this lecture about kind of the, the, the beginnings of the Moog synthesizer. And so pause the video here and watch um, the video linked below about the, for about the first 11 minutes or so, and it gives you a really great idea of the sound and the process of, of the, the Moog synthesizer in its early years. So pause the video, watch that, and then we'll come back. So that was great. The video was a great uh, way of um, understanding kind of the development of the Moog and, and some of the sounds, etc. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about the, the, the addition of the keyboard um, to the Moog synthesizer. Unlike the, the Buchla synthesizer you might read about in that was being produced in San Francisco, Moog, Robert Moog was really receptive to um, uh, recommendations or critique of the Moog, and so he added that keyboard uh, right away to the, to the Moog synthesizer to make it more useful or more, more available to um, musicians to use. And really the pairing of the keyboard with the Moog synthesizer made keyboards synonymous um, with synthesizers. And so as mentioned in the article you read, when people go into a shop and they say, I want to see your electronic instruments, you're directed to the keyboard synthesizer section. So uh, even though in the very beginning, when there was a lot of interpretive flexibility with the synthesizer in terms of the form, uh, the addition of the keyboard really solidified and the form eventually collapsed onto this keyboard type synthesizer. And this is a perfect example of how the social construction of technology works. Um, so the original uh, synthesizers were modular, they were keyboardless, and Moog really adopted the, the, the package to the wishes of the musician and the, and the public. Um, and only until recently, uh, with the computer graphics interface and the more recent instruments like that we'll talk about later on in the lecture, um, the keyboard had this dominance over electronic instruments and synthesizers. And so um, until recently, when you have kind of a computer graphics format, the, 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 that collapse of forms with the synthesizer as a keyboard instrument was really dominant until recently. So I thought we should have uh, listen to some examples of the early synthesizer music on both the Moog and the Buchla synthesizers, as you read about in your article. So the first um, example I'll play for you here as an audio form is um, taken from Switched On Bach, which is a, uh, an album produced by Wendy Carlos, a musician who worked closely with Robert Moog in the 1960s. And Switched On Bach, as you read in your article, was uh, really kind of the first album that made, made people, made musicians and music critics sit up and take notice of the synthesizer and its possibilities. So by pairing this kind of serious Bach music with this new experimental instrument, uh, it really helped uh, kind of fuel the adoption of the synthesizer as a serious instrument for, for musicians. Um, so I'll play an example of this uh, in a second, but I want to note what you're hearing in the, in the next example of Switched on Bach is not just a live performance where she's playing on the keyboard and it's being manipulated. It was really a time consuming process um, the original Moog synthesizers were monophonic, so you could only play one note at a time, and you had to release that note before the next one played. And so by in, in making this Switched On Bach album, Wendy Carlos had to work for over five months, over a thousand hours of time um, recording these sounds on a, on a tape, and then putting them all together, assembling them all together as the, the final album. Um, so let's listen to a little bit of this Switched On Bach. There's about a minute or so of a, of a piece. Here we are. Thank you. 
that was a nice example of, again, this ground mapping music of um, the marriage of kind of this old uh, classical music um, of Bach and this new um, really uh, wild sound uh, for the times. This is done in, again, 1968 and really had many albums that came out afterward, um, the Well-Tempered Synthesizer, etc. Um, I thought I'd give you two more examples that I'd like you to listen to a bit of. The, the first one would be by um, Susan Chiani, which is, she's a musician who worked with the Buchla synthesizer, that kind of competing synthesizer uh, in the early 60s, and which didn't have a keyboard, which was really kind of meant for um, experimental music, and it was kind of, uh, the, the inventor did not want to cave in to the, um, the wants of certain musicians to add a keyboard, add that certain form. Um, but uh, Chani's um, Buchel concerts here, I've linked the video below, um, are a great example of this kind of um, avant-garde type of, of music that was that was described as having a d just distinctly feminine sound as opposed to kind of the other synthesizer pieces going on in the 1960s, uh, particularly the, the one Silver Apples of the Moon by Morton uh, Sabotnik. Um, so I'll pause the video here and listen to a little bit of this Buchla concerts. Again, this is a um, recording from a, um, a live uh, a live show, uh, and it's a very different sound as, compo as a, compared to the Switched on Bach in terms of the way music is being presented. Um, it's much less rooted in the keyboard tradition that had dominated Western Europe and America for so many time, so a long time. But listen to the first um, few minutes of it. Um, it's a long, longer piece. If you would like, listen to more of it. But listen to the first few minutes of this Buchla concerts, and then come back here. Um, I've also given you an example of um, the Mother Mallard group uh, working out of kind of uh, upstate New York, and um, this is again an example of of the synthesizer being used by um, composers and musicians in a, in a in a different way. Um, all of these exa examples really were um, the f kind of at the forefront of other rock rock groups um, uh, adopting the synthesizer, like the Beatles and uh, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, and all these earlier rock groups who really kind of took to the synthesizer and added it to their repertoire of sound. Um, but yeah, take a take a pause here, listen to both the Susan Chani concert and to the Mother Mallard piece, and then come back and we'll keep keep talking. So I hope you enjoyed both of those pieces. Um, I think thinking about all all three or all at least all the kind of early synthesizer pieces, it's important to remember that the idea of the social construction of technology, and to understand that these these musical sounds were coming about at a certain moment in history. And we've talked about the 1960s and 70s a little bit in terms of um, the kind of desire for this kind of transcendent or spiritual meaning outside of institutions when we're talking about music and religion. And really you can hear in all of these audio works um, culture permeating this music. So again, this is a time in the 60s and 70s when many people were looking for kind of transcendent spiritual meaning and uh, the kind of spaced out kind of um, head tripping sound that the that the synthesizer, you know, called up was re it really fit the kind of the social moment, the social milieu, and so that's another reason why the synthesizer took off as an instrument in the in the 1960s. And so uh, I would really encourage you. Uh, I spent a, a, quite a long time going down the rabbit hole of YouTube, uh, looking at these early 60s and 70s synthesizer pieces. Um, uh, really, kind of some amazing work out there that is is quite different than what you hear nowadays, and and really you don't hear uh, these early synth pieces very much. So I'd encourage you, if you have some time, um, to kind of, again, go go video to video in, on YouTube and really explore some of this musical space that was happening in the 60s and 70s. And um, it's, I think you'll find it rewarding. So moving on from the synthesizer, we, we talked, you've read about it, we've talked a bit about it. But I want to just address a few of the kind of later technologies that were that started coming about um, uh, after the synthesizer. So the original synthesizers were these analog machines, large. They eventually collapsed down into much smaller and or um, digital machines as time went by, as, as um, transistors transitioned to integrated circuits, etc. cetera. Um, but then I gave you an example in your required listening of some Brian Eno works, uh, the 77 million paintings. And Eno is a 
pretty famous uh, musician who um, has been very interested in the kind of idea of generative art or generative music. And this is basically creating these kind of ambient soundscapes that fit with, at least in the 77 paintings context, fit with um, Im shifting images. And basically there weren't 77 million paintings in the in the CD and, and software that he re released with, with this piece, but the combination of the two, there's, there's just millions upon millions of combinations that will happen in this generative artwork. Um, generative music has been, and generative art has been around for quite a long time. There's old um, musical dice games in the, in the 1700s that would, um, that uh, composers would put snippets of phrases and you'd roll a die and then you'd um, take that snippet of phrase and put it in line and basically craft a kind of a generative piece that way with, with dice and pre-composed pieces of forms, um, pieces of music. The 77 million paintings you can still buy. It's a DVD and the software you can run on your computer. It's a little, um, it's like, not uh, very available, so it's not necessarily easy to get, get to, but um, really interesting examples. And so what I want you to do is go pause the video and go look at these two competing um, clips that I gave you. One, uh, again, this is generative music, so it's the same piece of software, but it's creating different, matching different pieces of music with different paintings and visuals. And so there's one, um, I would say just listen to both of those and, and kind of compare and contrast them a little bit. Um, I think they're a very fascinating way of, of that, that art and music is, a direction art and music is taking still. Um, generative, generative art is still something that people are very interested in. Um, but these are examples of later um, technologies. This is an example of computer software. And now we have this digital age. We're no longer dealing with patch cords and cables with a large analog Moog synthesizer but people are dealing with music on the kind of computer uh, in a box really and kind of the possibilities that software can give you um, in making music. So pause again, listen to the, the two examples for a little bit for 77 million paintings, and then come back and we'll talk about another type of music technology um, that is now only just being kind of explored. So the uh, final piece of technology I'll talk about in this um, lecture is the example um, kind of invented and are made famous by Imogen Heap, who is a, a famous musician. And she's been working on these gloves called the Mimu gloves. And what they are really is um, a set of gloves with um, uh, that can, can recognize gesture and recognize position, etc., and is linked to a sound bank, a, you know, a computer software program that can call up different sounds, that can um, you know, affect the volume, etc. And um, again, what I want you to do is pause and watch this, the linked video below. It's a really kind of introduction to these, these early iterations of these gloves. Um, these gloves have been uh, going through different changes and right now you can, they're not available right now, but if you can get on their list and have $6,500, you can uh, order a pair of these gloves and, and integrate them into your music making. Uh, they've been used by many famous musicians. Ariana Grande is probably one of the more famous ones who's uh, used some of these gloves in her concerts. Um, but what you have um, is a, an, another example of this social construction of technology. Um, so musicians who are performing live, especially, which is becoming much more important uh, now than it was a few years ago, um, musicians are performing live to make, you know, to make their money. Before, a few years ago, people could put out albums, but now it's really not as, as profitable to put out recorded music. It's much more profitable to do live shows. And so this kind of push towards live music and live control is gave, um, or at least maybe inspired uh, Imogen keeps development of these of these gloves to kind of reclaim the um, the performing of music and kind of get it outside the computer box to get it again into this performative physical space that that humans uh, we occupy and so while you're seeing in the video when you take a break to watch this video what you're seeing is these kind of early iterations of a Mimu gl music glove tech, uh, technology and I want you to just think about the the process that the synthesizer went through um, and imagine the possibility for these types of um, musical interactions or computer interactions with physical things. Um, really, what you're seeing now is kind of fairly clunky, but imagine in the future when all these things have basically disappeared into all the circuits and, and uh, all the stuff has disappeared into your clothing and it's much more um, 
much more seamlessly integrated into our world. The possibility for music making is really, really interesting. And I think if you pair this with things like augmented reality and, and other software extensions, there's some real um, amazing things about to be happening with kind of music, gesture control, um, computer interfaces that are not at a keyboard and a mouse, but actually out in physical space. So take a break, um, pause and watch um, about 10 minutes of Imogen's video that I've linked below and come back. So I hope you enjoyed the lecture and all the linked uh, videos. So I'll just have a little recap here in the last of our two slides. Um, the first thing to remember is that the social construction of technology is an important way of understanding how technology is invented and adopted and eventually changed and how it fits within a very specific social milieu. So the kind of three stages of that technology goes through um, is this interpretive flexibility when it's first invented, um, that there's a closure and collapse of form when, when people kind of settle on what, what form they like, and that this technological artifact has consequences in the wider socio-political environment. Uh, that are, it's a, important to remember and a good way of uh, assessing the importance and impact of that technology. So technology doesn't um, determine human action, etc. Technology is not invented in a vacuum, but it's very much part of our social cultural uh, context, just like everything we talked about in this class. And that the second that synthesizer and all music technology, again, develops in this specific technological and social moment. And so I talked about how the synthesizer could only be possibly uh, invented and or adopted because of the cheapness of transistors at the time in the 60s. Um, and that the kind of 1960s, 70s search for transcendent experiences or spiritual meaning, etc., really played into the adoption of the synthesizer because it gave you the kind of um, out of uh, kind of a head tripping experience with all the kind of new and different sounds. So while nowadays it may sound old fashioned to us because we're used to such a wide variety, if you put yourself back in the shoes of people in the late 60s and 70s, this was um, a pretty uh, huge moment in terms of the expansion of musical sound into places we yet hadn't heard yet, right? And just a reminder that the quiz uh, is again coming up this week uh, and that I'll have, uh, be covering most everything we've done, talked about since week three until this week, uh, week six. Um, and also very much important to remember that the final product approval date is coming up. And so you need to be in contact with me um, through email or Canvas messaging to get my approval. And again, uh, if you haven't started this process, I typically will have, ask you to refine your ideas so we come up with an acceptable and achievable final project. So make sure you plan on, on um, giving some time to uh, let that process work out, not wait till the very, very end for your to, to contact me for your approval. And as a humorous aside, there's a little fun video, I think, linked below uh, where you can watch uh, Synthesizer Battle. I thought um, you should pay attention maybe a little bit to the, the, the digital versus analog synthesizer, and I thought that it might, uh, might say something. Uh, it may not. It's also just a silly cartoon. But thanks.